Hello and welcome. Uh, I am Ty Smith and I work at Swirls Labs. And today we are going to be talking about unlocking real world assets, tokenizing with Hedera using the Hedera token service and smart contracts. Uh, again, yeah, I'm Ty Smith. I'm Senior Product Manager at Swirls Labs. Uh, if you would like to follow me, you can follow me on Telegram or Twitter at SL underscore Patches. Uh, patches is my online handle. Um, and today, we are going to be going over RWAs. Um, it is a very big asset class, and a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a history on what RWAs are, in case you're unaware, a little uh, intro into Hedera. And then we're going to do a on-hands uh, development of deploying a smart contract that can mint NFTs on the Hedera token service. And this is a um, pretty basic version of how you could tokenize real-world assets utilizing both EVM technology and Solidity contracts and the Hedera token service for the tokenization of a real-world asset. So uh, what are tokenized RWAs? Uh, in general, uh, it's very, very simple concept. It is a token that represents a real-world asset. And this is not anything new. Um, 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, uh, we had sealed clay tokens that were used to sell livestock and oil in marketplaces. And so that was a tokenized asset that would allow you to do trade and commerce in a much easier way than moving a bunch of cattle uh, and taking them into town. Uh, and it was kind of how we based our economic systems off of and how we exchange value. So tokenizing real world assets to make commerce easier has been a very long tradition. And uh, we're just kind of entering the new age of it where we have decentralized digital age of tokenized real world assets. Uh, we're in the digital age right now and banks typically have real world assets in internal databases and there's uh, internal ledgers and we're bringing them on chain. So why are we bringing them on chain? What is this uh, revolution? Why we keep talking about RWAs? Um, here's the, the four main reasons. One is liquidity. If you have a real world asset inside of a market that does not have that much liquidity, but it's a very good asset, if you can tokenize it in a decentralized manner, you can get a decentralized access to liquidity and global access to liquidity in jurisdictions that can purchase that. So there's a lot of incentive to decentralize the tokenization so that you can have a bigger pool of liquidity and more opportunity for investment and investors. Uh, the second part, which is really, I think, true to the crypto ethos, is fractional ownership. So if, a token, if, a, if an asset is $150,000, that's a very high price point for most people on the planet to gain. But if you can fractionalize that, and someone can spend $1,000 to get a fraction of that asset, now they can be in an investment class and have upside opportunity that they were priced out of uh, previously, and the person who owns that asset has more people who can provide liquidity to it in a fractional way. And so it's a, it's a benefit for both the consumer and someone who wants to have good investments, and it's a benefit for the person who owns the asset so that they can get more liquidity uh, and, and purchasing. Transparency. Uh, blockchain technology ensures transparency and traceability of transactions. Uh, that's quite important. Uh, it helps bring trustlessness to, the, to it, and uh, the blockchain technology allows not a... Um, double, like say if it's a carbon credit, uh, the fact that it's transparent allows you to see that it's not being minted twice, because once it is, then you're double spending and it doesn't make as much sense to even purchase that carbon credit. So transparency is very important and blockchain technology lends itself very well to having transparent transactions. Uh, and then security. If everything is in a internal bank database about an asset and ransomware is put into that database, you have a problem. You have to trust that the ransomware doesn't manipulate what those values were, and it's centralized and it's non-transparent. If it's on a blockchain, you gain the security of the blockchain, you gain the transparency, uh, and it's not as easy to attack or destroy um, provenance of assets in which you want to know how and guarantee are correct. So this is the super fun part. Let's talk about compliance. Um, Real world assets are, and tokenizing them, is not really that hard in technology. We've had NFTs since 2015 and, and a little before. Uh, tokenizing on blockchain makes a lot of sense, quite easy. But the problem with real world assets is not how to tokenize them technically, it's how to make sure they're legally viable and work as intended for the consumer and the person tokenizing their asset. 
So some of the, some of the challenges um, right now in America uh, are, are these securities. Uh, it, you know, ETH and securities, Ethereum is not classified as a security, we don't think, because now it has an ETF, so it might be a commodity. But just the fact that we don't have it in black and white makes it hard and difficult to engage with this space in compliance. Um, what is the classification of an RWA token? It's, again, not hardened by law. It's not black and white. And so without that legal and regulatory framework, it is a little difficult to convince giant um, companies that are very risk adverse to tokenize their assets. Uh, taxation challenges, uh, very, very interesting and complicated. Uh, determining how do you tax the tokenized asset if it is a tokenized building in China and you own it in Australia, who do you pay taxes to uh, in the profits and loss? Um, it, there's a lot of complicated, non-worked out um, things that need to exist uh, in this. And so, again, right now on the cutting edge of RWAs, most of the time and thought and energy is being put into what is legally viable, where, where are the answers to these, these difficult questions so that we can easily onboard uh, a giant asset class onto the chain. Uh, setting up legal entities, some asset classes you can't buy as an individual and you need to have a company. So is that, and then what are the taxation obligations of that company and where it's, uh, where it's founded in uh, geolocation? Uh, reporting the profits and losses, if that uh, tokenized asset gains a lot of profit, is that reported to Australia or is that reported to China and who do you pay? Um, and then the legal rights and ownership, which I think is, again, very, very complicated and extremely important. If the lease owner of a building tokenizes a floor of that building and you purchase it, and then that lease owner sells the entire lease to a new person who does not respect those tokens, do you have any legal recourse? Uh, or did you just kind of buy uh, something that is now non-existent? Um, yeah, so again, there's a lot of nuance uh, in the compliance. Um, this is the last slide uh, but, uh, of compliance challenges, but again, I, I think this is the most important part of the future of RWAs to make sure we can onboard this asset, uh, asset class. Uh, regulatory uncertainty, uh, the global viability. Different countries have varying regulations of tokenized assets, so um, how do we get a regulatory framework that is global that allows the ease of transition of ownership uh, in a way that makes people, again, that are risk averse, feel comfortable purchasing and tokenizing their assets. Uh, the fact that everything is continually changing in all of these governments is another just compliance challenge. There's no solution to this, but a lot of governments are thinking about how to govern these asset, this asset class, and with those continually changing, if you tokenize something today, you must make sure that you're paying attention to the governments that uh, control the jurisdictions of both the, the tokenized asset and who own them to make sure that things aren't changing under you. Because you could have done it and said, okay, well, I know what the law is, and then the law changes. And then you have this asset that is now non-compliant, even though it was compliant. So just being aware of these jurisdictional changes and evolving policies. Uh, and then again, uh, jurisdictional ambiguity, determining uh, if uh, regulations apply in a certain place, uh, the decentralized asset works over here and not over here, or it has to be a qualified investor in this jurisdiction and prove that they have uh, either KYC or know your business. Um, I'm just talking about problems, and there's a lot of them, but uh, problems are also opportunities. And if we can uh, opportunistically fix these issues, we can onboard, again, around $16 trillion of new um, uh, of new assets onto blockchain and blockchain technology by 2030. So that's why all of these uh, problems are very important for technologists to work with governmental entities to think about the correct solution. Because if we do it right in the first pass, then we can easily onboard quicker uh, a better system for both investors and people who own assets. All right, two, two, more, <laughs> two more sections of compliance challenges. Uh, security and fraud, uh, fraud prevention. Um, need to make sure that you're protecting your investor, ensuring the token offerings comply with those security laws and, the, and make sure that there are legal recourse for the people who purchase the token so that they don't, again, if that lease owner were to sell the lease, they have no recourse, making sure that the, the law allows them to have some sort of legal recourse to gain back value that they've invested. Uh, Anti-fraud measures, implementing systems to prevent and detect fraudulent activities. Um, the biggest RWA in circulation is USDC, run by Circle, and they, they, USDC can be frozen by Circle, the legal entity, and that is a compliance, there's a compliance reason for that. And so that's an anti-fraud measure that we can see in production today, uh, and making sure that we have an eye on that as technologists for uh, compliance with the government. 
Uh, and then the last one, AML and KYC requirements. This is highly important because some asset classes don't allow you to have more than 15% in a certain country. So it's not even just about tokenizing, it's not about how do you protect the investor, it's about knowing that you're not over allocating too much of a tokenized asset into one jurisdiction. And so KYC and anti-money uh, anti laundering laws um, are extremely important to comply with. And then again, different levels of know your customer. Some asset classes you need to have a qualified uh, or sophisticated investor, which means you have to prove you have over $150,000 to get into that investment class. And so making sure that you don't just have KYC, but you have the different levels that are required uh, to guarantee that this is, a, this is correct, this is legal, this is compliant, and now I can tokenize your asset and we can all gain the value from that. All right, so that's all the problems. Uh, what are the solutions? So enter Hedera. If, you are not, uh, if you're not sure what Hedera is, it is a L1. It is a DAG network utilizing Hashcraft consensus. Uh, it's a next-gen consensus algorithm, so it is faster, fairer, secure uh, transactions with Hashcraft. Uh, it is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant, which gives it that faster and more secure execution, and it brings efficiency. So it can go up to 10,000 TPS, uh, that's throttled down, it can go up to 100,000 when the throttle is removed, and it gives you three to five seconds to true finality. It has stable governance, and specifically for real-world assets, the way that Hedera is governed um, is extremely important. We have a governing council right now that is 33 entities like Google and Ubisoft across the globe, and because they are giant corporations across the globe, and they've been helping direct the uh, creation of this technology for the, since its creation, we have a good conceptual understanding of the compliance challenges around the world that corporations fully understand, and we've been working on making sure that there's um, tooling and accessibility to comply inside of the protocol. And so our stable governance model managed by leading global organizations has allowed Hedera to be a leader in the RWA asset class because our services were built with this compliance thought about in, you know, for the last five, uh, five, 10 years. Uh, Eco-conscious, um, Hedera is actually very, very big in the um, carbon credit market and, and efficiency, or um, carbon credit market and, and green ESG. And so one transaction on Hedera is about one one thousandth the energy usage of a transaction on the Visa transaction network. So it's extremely green. Uh, it's really nice to track carbon and not put carbon out. And so Hedera is really good at reducing that carbon impact while you're tracking the carbon uh, in ESG. And then it's cross-chain ready. Uh, we, have, uh, we strive for EVM equivalency, and you can deploy Solidity smart contracts. Uh, our number one DEX is a Uniswap fork. Uh, we have a fork of Aave uh, v2 coming out as a lending protocol. And so even though we have our own um, native services like the Hedera token service, you can deploy Solidity smart contracts to interact with those services so you don't have to learn an entire new language just to, just to deploy on Hedera. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to deploy a smart contract onto Hedera that is going to mint tokens on the Hedera token service. It's a very basic program, but it will show you how, uh, if you want to create a real-world asset, how to deploy a smart contract that can do that uh, with the native services on Hedera. So uh, some of the things that the token service have that uh, address the compliance challenges that I just went over. We do have something called a KYC key on a token. So the Hedera token service is a protocol level service. It is not a smart contract, and so you don't have as much flexibility as smart contracts, but you have a lot more security around interacting with the token service. As an example, if you use the wrong compiler, you're not going to have a potential security flaw because you don't compile the code, it's not a smart contract, it's done on the protocol level. When you have an NFT in your, uh, in your wallet, if you interact with it, it's impossible for that NFT to drain your, your wallet. It's not a smart contract, right? So you have these guardrails that allow the token service to provide a little bit more value and, guard, um, and safety and security for the people tokenizing and for the people interacting with those tokens. With the KYC key, it allows you to do a lot of things like um, comply with making sure that only people that have been uh, approved to own that asset or hold that asset in their wallet can. So if you create uh, something that needs to be KYC'd and tokenize it, and you put it out into a decentralized market, 
you need to sign with the KYC key to allow another, oh, sorry. Uh, you need to sign with the KYC key uh, to allow a wallet to access it. So you can have decentralized distribution of a token with a key that will allow you to, uh, um, to, to approve accounts to hold it. So you don't need to create marketplaces or centralized systems to make sure that it doesn't spill out into the open market. The token service has thought about making sure you can be compliant with the least amount of friction to the person tokenizing the asset by adding a KYC key to the token level. We also have things like freeze keys and wipe keys. So along with uh, the KYC key, if you need to be able to freeze an asset that is inside of an account, you just add the freeze key to the token when you create it, and then you'll be able to freeze or wipe if you want to remove them from accounts, depending on what your asset class is. You can do so at the protocol level. This does bring up, um, how, how, if I'm a consumer, how do I know someone's not just going to wipe it out of my account, right? So with the security that we bring for the token issuer, we also bring transparency to the person who could purchase the token. After you create a token, you cannot change the keys that are assigned to that token class. And so if you have a token that has no keys on it, no KYC, no freeze, no wipe keys, and you put that and distribute it, it can never have those keys. And so even though we have stringent rules that will allow people to wipe and freeze and only allow KYC, if the token's not created with them, the person who looks at that token knows that it can't be added. So you have that trustlessness about the token service, you look at the key list and you say, I'm okay with owning this asset or I'm not, but it cannot change once you own it. So we bring that trustlessness and that security to the consumer along with that flexibility of compliance to the issuer and they must know what they need to comply with when they create it because it cannot change. Yeah, and then uh, the, the high level architecture, uh, what we're gonna do today is we're going to launch a smart contract. That smart contract is going to mint a new NFT uh, and then we're going to send it to a wallet. So that's what we're gonna get into right now. Um, so first, uh, to create a testnet account on Hedera, just go to portal.hedera.com and uh, log in with an email. Uh, from there, you'll be assigned a wallet, and then you can download, uh, you can take the wallet and the private key and put it into your M file. After you have your Hedera uh, account, you can go to Remix. So we're just gonna use uh, the online uh, uh, website Remix to create the Solidity files. Uh, and then once you do that, you need to import uh, some libraries for this demo. On the last slide of this presentation, there's gonna be a download of the project file, so you can just download it and compile locally if you would like. Uh, but I am going to show what, uh, um, I am gonna show Remix um, in the IDE and sort of what it looks like here. So this is after I have, uh, oh yeah, you, <laughs> is that better? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is uh, after I have already included all of the libraries, the Solidity libraries that are gonna need to be included in the main uh, project file, or the main Solidity file. So after you include those, and again, uh, in the presentation, uh, where we go? Smooth as butter, where we got? Here. Here we go. All right, so here uh, is a link to the GitHub of all of the source files that you need to copy over. Um, so I've already done that in this example. So we are creating nftcreator.sol, and we have our function up here. This is how you can create an NFT in a smart contract. It's nothing uh, terribly complicated. We have the interface for the token service, creating token keys. Uh, we get the single key, uh, the supply, and the contract ID. And then we just set things like the name, uh, the symbol, the memo, uh, the treasury, uh, what is the token supply type, um, if it's true, it's, it's finite, it's false, it's uh, infinite, uh, what's the max supply, um, the token keys are where you would put the keys for that uh, NFT that you're minting, if you want the KYC key, the freeze key, the wipe key, um, freezing defaults, and then uh, the expiry. So at the end of this function, it returns the created token, uh, we can go down here, we can see minting. So this mints the token, uh, it just takes in the metadata and then we'll create a new serial number on that token class and return it. 
And then this is a simple function to take that newly minted serial number um, and that token class, and you just put in the receiver address uh, as an EVM address, and it will send it. So after you have the uh, NFT creator dot soul um, filled out, you can compile and get the bytecode. Um, I've already done that, so I'm not going to compile live, but uh, what do we got? Go up here. You can see I've added the NFT creator soul bin file. So I have the bytecode already in my project uh, in my IDE. Go here. Awesome. Well, I just did this in the integer. So uh, one of the best, an ability to use JavaScript really enables a massive amount of developers uh, to access the, this ability. So we're actually going to use JavaScript and our JavaScript SDK to deploy the smart contract, that Solidity smart contract on network, and to interact with it. And so uh, in your project, first uh, you can create npm init, and then install both .env and the Hashgraph SDK. Uh, and then compile the bytecode and put it into your NFT, NFT creator soul uh, bin file, and then create a index file. Um, and uh, again, I've already done that in my IDE. And then this is the code that you need to create the contract. And so uh, first you need the instructor account ID. On Hedera, we have two different account IDs the native Hedera accounts, and then the EVM equivalent accounts. So I am just hard coding the EVM equivalent account of a account to send this to, and it's in the project files. Uh, usually it's 0 .0 0.0.12345 as a Hedera native account ID, and then uh, I just pulled up the EVM uh, equivalent account ID and put it in here. So when you interact with a smart contract, typically they are gonna need the EVM address of that account to send to. Then I'm going to read the bytecode of the contract that we just wrote and, and compiled. From there, I'm going to create the contract in a new create contract flow, uh, set the gas, and then set the bytecode. Execute that with a, a, knit, a knitted client. So use your um, new portal account that you got from Hedera Testnet to init a client, and then uh, use that to execute this create contract function. After that, we're going to wait and make sure we get a receipt back and get the contract ID, because we're going to need that contract ID to then execute the JavaScript functions and the um, EVM functions on that contract. So then we just you know, write it out into the console, hey, this is the contract ID. Below that, we're going to create a token after that contract is released. So here we can see a new contract execution transaction. We set the contract ID to the new one that was just returned from us uh, to us. Set the gas again uh, and the, uh, the payable amount. And then you set the function. So we have all the functions that we set in that Solidity contract. Here is where we call, excuse me, where we call that function and then we pass in the parameters. So after the create NFT function, we can see new contract function parameters and we add a string for the NFT name, which is ETH uh, CC RWA Hedera Workshop. We add a string for the symbol which is what gets shows in tickers, um, so that's uh, RWA POC. And then you can add an NFT memo. That might be important for RWAs uh, for the memo of when you issue it to tie back to the asset inside of an internal system or a different uh, notifier or locator. Uh, and so if you need to add a memo, it's, uh, you can just add one and then um, as, a, as a parameter. And then uh, set the max supply of the NFT. It could be one of one, it could be one of 1,000, uh, whatever your max supply is and then uh, the expiry date, which I'm not gonna go too deep into that, but just set an expiration date in between those two numbers in the comment. From there, uh, you can see that we just, we call the create token and we again execute it with that initted testnet client for Hedera. Uh, we get the record back and make sure that we get the uh, solidity address, uh, that you can see uh, contract function result get address. And then we get the token ID from that, from the Solidity address so that we can write it out in the console and show you this is the token ID and that's gonna be the Hedera native token ID of 0, .0, 0. From there, uh, now you have created the token. So when you create a token class, it does not mean anything exists yet, it just means that you have created the, the token ID in which you can mint onto. And so from that token ID class that has been created, now we can mint a token that has metadata tied to it. So again, we're going to get a to contract execution transaction. We're gonna set the contract ID to that contract ID that we created earlier. 
set the gas, uh, the max transaction fee, and then set the function to mint an NFT. And from here, we're gonna do a new contract function parameters and uh, add the address of the token ID solidity address. So again, when you interact with a smart contract and you're calling it, you need to use the EVM addresses of those assets because solidity and EVM understands those, those addresses uh, and not the 0.0, .0 native ones. And then we added a, a bytes array of the metadata. And so the metadata is defined uh, when I show the code and we, we run into my IDE, I'll show you where that is. Uh, but it is just a string of an IPFS link that is the metadata file of, um, that points to all of the attributes and then also has a link to an image file. So standard uh, IPFS uh, metadata and then we just put a buffer on that and put it into a bytes array and add it to the um, contract function call. Again, from there, we just execute it with the knitted client on testnet. We get the record back uh, and wait for that so we can get the receipt and then we get the serial number that we just minted. So the first mint is gonna be serial number one. It doesn't start at zero, it starts at one. And then from there, it just increments up to the max supply. So you can't mint more than the max supply, that makes sense. Uh, and then every time you mint, you'll get back a unique serial number. And the way that you can reference this on a Hedera native uh, scanner or you're trying to look for it, you put in the token ID, which would be you know, 0 .0 0 0.0.12345. And then the mint number or the serial number would be say three. And then that's how you know that would be the, the specific unique identifier for the asset you just created. After all that, it's, you know, we have a smart contract, we have created a new token class, we have minted on that token class, now you need to send it to somebody. Uh, it's no good if it's just sitting in the smart contract. So from here, we're going to transfer the token. So again, we do a new contract execution transaction, we set the ID, and then we're gonna call the function transfer NFT. We add the function parameters of the solidity address. The instructor account ID is the hard-coded account ID for the demo, so I have an account ID that's ready to take this, um, take any NFTs that you make from these project files. And then you add which serial number you're sending. So if you mint 200 and it's inside the, the, the contract, you need to make sure you assign the serial number so it knows which one it's sending out uh, from that token class. After that, we, uh, we freeze with the client, we sign with the operator key, and then we can see we transfer the token, execute it with the initiated client, get the receipt, uh, and it's, it's a little repetitive, but that's, that's just how you do it, right? So uh, right now, we can go over to our index file, and we can see that I have created uh, this exact file, and we have the hard-coded metadata here. This is a IPFS link. We init our client, so we just get the, um, from our file, we get the private key and the account ID, get our operator key and ID, and then we init the client and set our operators. So from here, we can use the client to execute functions. And then I just have all of the functions we sort of just went over. So I'm not gonna do that uh, to you guys, but I am just going to call it. So we are on, um, conference Wi-Fi, unsure how fast this will go or not. Um, I'm hoping it will go uh, to the speed of where I'm done this sentence, at least the first thing has console logged out into my terminal that is right here. Look at that. All right, so we have a contract ID. Uh, it was just created and we can see that is a Hedera native address that we're putting out. Then we can see that we created the token class. So right here, we have a token class and then we minted that with a serial number one so first, let's, let's take the contract ID and go to Hedera's Explorer. So you just go to hash uh, scan. Again, we're on Wi-Fi, so unsure if it's gotta be a little slow. So here we just put in the contract ID and we can see the contract in hash scan. Fantastic. So from that, let's go back and get the token ID. See that token in the, um, the Explorer, and we see it. We can see our just a memo, we can see the name that we gave it with ECC, RWA, Hedera Workshop. Uh, we can see the account that is the treasury, and that is the contract. So the contract is the treasury account and is currently holding that asset. We have serial number one, so if we go back to this NFT, we can click here, and this is the NFT that we just minted through a smart contract. Fantastic, we can see the image. Uh, here are the attributes and properties. If you would like, you can click and go to the actual uh, location on IPFS uh, and see it there with both the metadata and the image. Fantastic. 
And then we transferred that NFT. So we can go over and sign into our wallet, pull up the test net, uh, here we go, go to my NFTs, and there it is. So we have successfully created a token class, minted an NFT on that token class all through Solidity, sent that token to a wallet that has now received it. That is a end-to-end -end execution of a Hedera token service NFT being minted through EVM. And now, if you, uh, you take this POC and you go further with it, you can add ancillary information that you need for your RWA, add in any other information that you need to tie to real-world assets and guarantee that compliance or guarantee that regulatory um, issuance to make sure that it's legal. And uh, you can utilize the, the languages that you know from Solidity to interact with Hedera's native token service and get the, the added benefits of security that it can lend to uh, your consumers. So this is just uh, the end of my presentation. We have resources and documentation. So you can go to the Hedera guides uh, and the Hedera Solidity file links on the, on the end of this presentation. Uh, link to the Remix Ethereum, and then again, the project file link. So if you don't want to do any of this and you just want to skip to the end, you can download the project files, run it locally, uh, and see how you can deploy a smart contract and min an NFT. So if any of this was uh, interesting to you, which I hope it was, uh, we do have a hackathon uh, with Hedera starting on July 22nd. There will be over $300,000 of prizes uh, to submit to. So just go to hellofuturehackathon.dev to register. And from July 22nd to August 20th, we will have a hackathon. And I hope you join us there. Thank you so much. <laughs>